Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this colloquium. Uh, we are going to talk about multi-factor authentication. As, as Ramses said, is very opportune moment to do this because uh, in a few days it's going to become mandatory in all the all the alliance clusters. Uh, so it's a good moment to talk about this. Okay, let's start. Okay, let's talk about the definition of MFA or multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication, MFA, two-factor authentication or 2FA along with similar terms is an electronic authentication method in which a user is granted access to a device, website, application or application only after successfully presenting two or more pieces of evidence or factors to an authentication mechanism. Uh, the different factors are, for example, knowledge, something that only the user knows, uh, possession, something, something that only the user has, and inherence, something the only the user is. Uh, MFA protects user data, which may include personal identification or financial assets, from being accessed by an un un unauthorized third party uh, that may have been able to discover, for example, a single password. We will explain the most common uses of MFA today and how uh, MFA is being implemented in our environment, in research computing. Knowledge. Knowledge factors are a form of authentication. In this form, the user is required to prove knowledge of a secret in order to authenticate. So the most common of this is a password. A password is a secret word or a string of characters that is used for user authentication. This is the most commonly used mechanism of authentication. I could say also that is the older one, uh, the oldest one. Uh, many multi-factor authentication techniques rely on passwords as one factor of authentication. Uh, variations include both longer ones uh, form from multiple words, a passphrase, or a shorter purely numeric uh, PIN that is commonly used for ATM access. Traditionally, passwords are expected to be memorized. Possession factors, something only the, the user has, has been used for authentication for centuries in the form of a key to a lock. The basic principle is that the key embodies a secret that is shared between the lock and the key. And the same principle underlies possession factor authentication in computer system. A security token is an example of a possession factor. Uh, disconnect, disconnected tokens have no connection to the client computer. They typically use a built-in screen to display the generated authentication data, which is manually typed in by the user. This type of token more, mostly use an OTP, or one-time password, that can only be used for that specific session. As you can see in the graphics, uh, the one in the left is a, a hardware token that it generates a number every minute. And that number can be used only once and only during that minute. And the other graphic shows uh, um, how, for example, Duo is used in a cellular phone and you can get a passcode generated by the by the app by the duo app in in that cell phone 
possession also is uh, the use of connected tokens that are devices that are physically connected to the computer to be used. Those devices transmit data automatically. There are a number of different types, including USB tokens, smart cards, and wireless tags. There is a, a, a inherent, these are factors associated with the user. They and are usually biometric methods, including finger, fingerprint, face, voice, or iris recognition. Behavioral biometrics such as keystroke dynamics can be also can also be used. Uh, Multi-factor authentication also has an application in physical security systems. These physical security systems are known and commonly referred to as access control. Multi-factor authentication is typically deployed in access control systems uh, through the use, firstly, of a physical possession such as a fob, a key card, access card, or a QR code displayed on a device, which acts as the identification credential. And secondly, a validation of one's identity, like facial biometrics or retinal scan. This form of authentication, this form of multi-factor authentication is commonly referred as facial verification or facial authentication. I think we all have seen in the movies, for example, how people uh, tap an access card and then uh, they have to show the face so the so the iris can be scanned uh, to verify that this is the person who regularly should be holding that access card. Uh, location, there is an, a, a, a fourth factor that is coming into play recently involving physical location of the user. While hardwired to the corporate network, a user could be allowed to log in using only a pin code. Where, uh, whereas if the user was off the network, entering a, co a code from a soft token as well could be required. So for example, you. Uh, limit to a system or to a device could be limited to only a user that is physically in the network, not remotely or in a different building. Uh, this could be seen as an acceptable standard where access into the office is controlled. So we are, of course, assuming that the person which is physically in the office is because already passed uh, some series of access control and and that presence in the office is legal or is legitimate. System for network admission control uh, work in similar ways where the level of network access can be contingent of, on the specific network a device is connected to, such so, so Wi-Fi versus wire connectivity. This also allows a user to move between offices and, and dynamically receive the same level of network as access in each. Multifactor authentication is the simplest, most effective way to make sure users really are who they say they are. Why is MFA important in IT security? This is uh, an example of some password hacks. In 2011, 77 million accounts of PlayStation were hacked. Uh, Adobe, 38 million. Yahoo, 3 billion. And this is not a typo. 3 billion accounts were hacked in 2014. Uh, under Armour, recently in 2018, 150 million accounts were hacked. Why passwords are easily hacked? Hackers have several methods to get your password, such as social engineering, brute force, malware, phishing, among others. Basically, 
if a hacker wants your password, they will get it one way or, or another. There are attacks that are, uh, for example, phishing attacks that are uh, generic. So they send millions of uh, phishing e emails. Somebody will buy the, the will buy the the email, but some of them can be targeted. So if a hacker wants the specific the power of a specific person, uh, they tailor uh, an email in that in in a way that the user uh, think that this is a legit legitimate uh, email and and bytes. So basically, if a hacker wants your password, they will get it. You can be sure of that. You can't stop a data breach, but you can make your password less useful to hackers. How? Using multi-factor authentication is possible. So even if someone gained access to your password, you still might be protected. This applies not only to access clusters or resources in the university. For example, your bank account. If you enable two-factor authentication with your bank account, it's probably that uh, a hacker may somehow get your password, but it's very difficult that he also gain access to the second factor. So it's a very, very good protection to, to enable multi-factor authentication in everything you can. The main benefit of multi-factor authentication is that it will enhance your organization security by requiring users to identify themselves by more than a username and a password. Uh, while important, usernames and passwords are vulnerable, vulnerable to brute force attacks and can be stolen by third parties. Enforcing the use of a multi-factor, uh, like a thumbprint or physical hardware key, means increased confidence that your organization will stay safe from cyber criminals. MFA at the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. The Digital Research Alliance of Canada shows Duo as its multiple factor authentication provider. Uh, Duo is a Cisco company. Uh, Cisco is a very well known of networking equipment. What are the benefits of multi factor authentication with Duo? Frustrate attackers, not users. Duo is the easiest multi-factor authentication solution for users and administrators. Duo Mobile and Verify Duo Push are just two examples of the convenient user-friendly multi-factor authentication methods that we support. All a user has to do is to down download the Duo Push application into their smartphone and voila, they are ready to authenticate. Uh, get adaptive authentication. Duo's adaptive authentication is an advanced type of uh, multi-factor authentication that lets you create custom access policies based on contextual factors like role, application, geographic location, network, and device health. Yes, uh, I, I am going to comment about the Shembo. The, it certainly frustrates users as well, uh, but, but you are going to get much more frustrated if your data is being accessed by a cyber criminal. You can be sure of that. Maybe it's annoying to have to, not only to provide a password, but also a second factor, but uh, 
think of a hacker or a cyber criminal having access to your bank account or to your credit card. They can do several nasty things. And I prefer to be frustrated with a second factor than to be frustrated because a cyber criminal stole my my money from my bank. Uh, uh, build a, fund, a foundation of for powerless. Dual power, power, passwordless authentication builds on MFA to verify user identity with login tools like biometrics, security keys, and the Duo Push mobile, mobile app. Users only have to verify once in a time frame set by administrators, making it simpler than ever to log on securely. Uh, as you all, if you are a user of uh, the Digital Alliance, you know that uh, we are already not using passwords. Uh, we are not using passwords anymore. We are using security, a uh, public key pair uh, that helps a lot. But of course, if a hacker takes over your computer, they have access to the private key of, of your key pair. So that's why a second factor is important to have because maybe the hacker have access to your to your computer, but most likely he's not going to have access to your to your cell phone. Uh, for Ryan's question, uh, the Alliance is implementing a, a procedure to do the automatic uh, automatic flow uh, data flows. So maybe you could uh, access the uh, the Alliance uh, website, and you will find how to to request and how to do that. Uh, when connecting to a Digital Research Alliance of Canada website or system, first the user will provide a username or a password key paid as user. For example, if you are accessing the, a website like CCDB, you will provide a password. If you are accessing a cluster through SSH, you are going to provide a, a private key that matches the public key that you already uploaded to CCTV. Uh, the graphic in the left is, for example, if you are accessing a CCTV, the website of CCTV. In that case, you have already provided a password, and now the website, the website is asking you to approve the sign-in request. The sign-in request is going to your cell phone and your cell phone is waiting for you to approve like, like the image to the right. So the user then will receive a push, that is called a push notification. The user will receive a notification in their phone asking for their approval. Of course, if you didn't ask for this, you must press the red button deny. But uh, usually you are aware that you are trying to access uh, a system or a website and you just mm, click on approve. Register in multiple factors. When you enable multi-factor authentication for your account, the Alliance strongly recommends that you configure at least two options for your second factor. For example, you can use a phone and uh, single use codes, a phone and a hardware key or two hardware keys. This will ensure that if you lose one factor, you can still use your other one to access your account. So for, we are talking here uh, the second factor. So for example, 
if you have the Duo mobile app, uh, but uh, you should also have, for example, a, a, a USB key, like a UV key. So if you lose your cell phone, at least you are going to be able to access from your computer using your UV key. Or you can have two UV keys configured, for example, one at home and the other one in your wallet. If you lose the one in your wallet, you still have another UV key at home that you can use. Of course, it's not a good idea to have both UV keys in the in your wallet. You lose your wallet, you lose your two hardware keys. Okay. Uh, when you use a small uh, a smartphone or tablet, uh, the the steps are this: you install the Duo mobile authentication application from the App Store or Google Play, depending on your operating system. Uh, you make sure to get the correct application because TOTP applications are, such as Aegis, Google Authenticator, or Microsoft Authenticator are not compatible with Duo and will not scan the QR code. So uh, you go to the CCDB, log in into your account and select my account, then multi-factor authentication management. Uh, under register a device, you click on Duo Mobile. You enter a name of your device, click on continue, and a QR code will be displayed. In the Duo mobile application, you tap set up account or the plus sign. Uh, you tap use a QR code, scan the QR code shown in your CCTV. Uh, important, make sure that your mobile device is connected to the internet over Wi-Fi or cellular data while you are scanning the QR code. Uh, you can use a YubiKey. A YubiKey is a hardware token made by Yubico company. Uh, if you don't have a smartphone or tablet or don't do not wish to use your phone or tablet for multi-factor authentication, or are often in a situation where when using your phone or tablet is not possible, then a YubiKey is your better option. Or remember, I will talk about a few minutes ago that YubiKey can be your second second factor. So you can have your mobile, uh, Duo mobile app in your cell phone, but also have a YubiKey just in case that for any reason you don't have your cell phone available. Uh, know that some YubiKey models are not compatible because they don't all support the YubiKey OTP function, which is required. We recommend using the YubiKey uh, 5 series, but Older devices you may already have could work. Uh, you please see this uh, Yubiko identification page for reference. A YubiKey 5 is the size of a small USB stick and costs between $67 and $100. There are different models that can fit a USB A, USB C, or Lightning ports. And uh, some uh, also use uh, or can support near field communication, NFC, for use with a phone or tablet. Uh, multiple, multiple protocols are supported by YubiKeys. Alliance clusters use Yubico one-time password. After you have registered a YubiKey for multi-factor authentication, when you log, log on to one of the clusters, you will be prompted for a one-time password. You respond by touching a button in your YubiKey, which generates a string of 32 characters to complete your authentication. Using a YubiKey does not require any typing on the keyboard. The YubiKey connected to your computer types the 32 character string when you touch this button. To register your YubiKey, you will need uh, its public ID private ID and secret key. If you have this information, go to the multi-factor authentication management page. The 
the same one where you register your your duo mobile. Uh, if you don't have this information, configure your key using the steps in, in the next slide. Yes, there is a way to, to, there are different tricks. You can use, uh, uh, SSH has a, a method in which uh, you use one thing called the SSH, uh, SSH agent. So in that case, you can do a single authentication in the morning. I use that single authentication throughout the day. Configuring YubiKey for Yubico OTP. Download and install the YubiKey Manager software from the Yubico website. Insert your YubiKey and launch the YubiKey Manager software. In the YubiKey Management software, select Applications, then OTP. Uh, select Configure for either a slot one or a slot two. A slot one corresponds corresponds to a short, short touch, pressing one to 2.5 seconds, while a slot two is a long touch on the key, pressing three to five seconds. A slot one is typically pre-registered for Ubiqu cloud mode. If you already, if you are already using this slot for other services, you can either use a slot two or click on swap to transfer the configuration to slot two before configuring slot one. Uh, select Yubico OTP, and then select use serial, then generate a private ID and a secret key. Securely save a copy of the data in the, in the public ID, private ID, and secret fee key fields before you click on finish. And as you will need the data for the next step. Important, make sure you click on finish in the previous step. You can and then you log on to the CCDB to register the YubiKey in the multi-factor authentication management, management page. Uh, using your second factor, if your account has multiple multi multi-factor authentication enabled, when you connect via SSH to a cluster which supports MFA, you will be prompted to use your second factor authentic your second factor as when you first use either your password or your SSH key. Well, uh, in in the case of uh, Alliance clusters, we are not using passwords anymore; only SSH key. The prompt is going to look like this one. So you just do an SSH, a cluster, uh, and after the SSH key is validated, you will get a text saying, enter a passcode or select one of the following options. The passcode is the one that is generated by the Duo mobile app, or the easiest way is to press one, and Duo will send a push to your to your to your cell phone. Uh, you just accept in your cell phone, and you are in. Uh, Multi-factor authentication is becoming mandatory, so. The, uh, uh, the Alliance strongly encourage users to enable multi-factor authentication for their accounts now, as this will become a requirement to access all clusters as of April of 2024. In order to get users enrolled progressively, the Alliance will institute periodic blackouts starting on February 6, uh, 2024, which will progressively increase in the scope until April of 2024. 
During these periods, users who have not enrolled into MFA will be unable to connect to certain clusters. The blackout periods are scheduled to occur on Tuesdays between noon and 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. The cluster which will, which will be subject to blackouts are as follows. Niagara, February 6th and 13th, so they are already done. Uh, Niagara and Cedar, February 20 and 27. Niagara, Cedar and Graham, uh, March 5 and 12. And all clusters on March 19 and uh, March 26. Uh, but as of April the 1st, it will be mandatory. If you don't have, uh, if you don't have not enrolled in to MFA, you will not be able to connect to any cluster. Okay. So enroll now to avoid being blocked from accessing the services. 